Hey everybody and welcome back to Cityscape Brewing. I'm Dennis Fields and today we're going to be talking about all the things that you should be doing when making a hazy IPA. We're going to talk about grains, we're going to talk about hops, we're going to talk about yeasts, what percentage of oats and other uh, adjuncts in order to get that mouthfeel for that creamy hazy IPA. Also, what kind of yeast should I be using? There's a lot on the market. Should I be using a liquid yeast? Should I be using a dry yeast? And which one's my favorite? We're gonna go through hops and the different oils and what makes those fruity, juicy flavors and everything in between. After you hit that like and subscribe button, grab yourself a beer and we're gonna get after it. Also, before we get started, consider supporting the channel by buying me a beer. You can hit the link right up here or the link in the video description below. So let's get into recipe building. First, we're gonna talk about malts. And that's the most important backbone of this whole thing, along with water, which we're also gonna get into too. So if you don't play around with water additions, this is a great one to start because it highly impacts the flavor and the mouthfeel of your beer. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. But first, we're gonna talk about specifically malts. And so you can always choose a base malt of either Pilsner or Two Row. I specifically use Two Row. And I'm gonna say uh, the percentages that I use of these type of grains, and you can build your own recipe based on those sizes, but I'll go through what I use for a five and a half gallon recipe. So for mine, I use 10 pounds of two row, which equals out to be about 70% of the grain bill. After that, I'm looking for adjuncts specifically to give that hazy appearance and help with the creamy mouthfeel of a hazy IPA. And so to get that, a lot of people will use a flaked product like flaked oats or flaked wheats. I use flaked oats and specifically I use two pounds of that, okay? And so you, can, you don't have to buy flaked oats also at your uh, homebrew supply store. You can just go buy rolled oats at the grocery store. It's cheaper and you get a lot more of them. So I use two pounds specifically for that and that equals out to be about 13.8 or 14% of your grain bill. After that, I like to add a little bit of white wheat. That's kind of optional, depending on if you add a little bit more oats and a little bit more two row, you can kind of create that, but I like the flavor and the addition of white wheat. And so I add a pound and a half of that, which equals out to be about 10% of the grain bill. And then I'm gonna let you in in a little tip that I like to add in my hazies to make them just a little bit different than everyone else's. And that is a half pound of honey malt. And so that'll equal out to be about three and a half percent of your grain bill. That honey malt, just the little tiny fraction that's in there is gonna help give that a little bit different of a, of a flavor. There's a little bit of a sweetness in the back end, a little bit of honey, and that's gonna help complement all those fruity uh, esters and uh, fruitiness flavors that we're gonna get from all the hops and the different yeast that we're gonna be adding later on. So the secret sauce, honey malt, add that. Throw in a, a half pound of that in your recipe, you will not be disappointed. So to recap, we're looking at 70% of your grain bill being a base malt, like two row or Pilsner, and then 30% being those other adjuncts. I like out of that 30%, I like half of that to be rolled oats, and the rest can be something else like that honey malt or uh, white wheat. So let's talk about water. And everybody's water is gonna be a little bit different, and so I'm gonna talk about a target water profile. And so you can get your water profile. If you haven't watched that uh, video on how to do that, I will link that in the video description below. It's gonna tell you where you can find one if you don't have one, how you can order one specific for your house, and then how you can bring your water additions and, and change them based on your recipe. But let's talk about a, specifically a target profile for a hazy IPA. After trying out a lot of different recipes and different water profiles, I found this one to be the best one. I like to have 75 for calcium, five for magnesium, 10 for sodium, 50 for chloride, and 150 for sulfate. And that's specific to this particular style of a hazy IPA. In addition to the regular water additions, I also add four grams of ascorbic acid into the mash. Ascorbic acid is basically vitamin C. That's gonna help prevent oxidation, specifically for hazy IPAs, but I also do this for pale ales and regular American IPAs, because that's gonna help scrub out any potential for oxidation when you're transferring or doing anything, even if you're, you're trying to purge your kegs and that kind of stuff. A lot of breweries actually do this when they can to preserve the shelf life of those specific styles that are susceptible to oxidation. All right, so how do I pick hops? Well, 
I don't just draw them out of a hat and see what happens when I put them in a hazy IPA. I actually look at the oil breakdowns per hop in order to pick specific styles that are gonna give those fruity flavors like grapefruit, mango, pineapple, citrus, etc. In order to get the information, you go straight to the source. So in this case, I actually printed off these cheat sheets, which I will put in front of you on the screen so you can go ahead and screenshot them. They're from Yakima Chief Hops, and they're really a survival compound breakdown for their specific hops. Each variety of hops has a different breakdown of oils. So looking at these charts, I'm gonna try and find some that are high in geranol and linenol specifically, and then a few others that are gonna give some of those flavors that we're going for. For this recipe, I'm choosing Citra, Centennial, Amarillo, Sabro, and Mandarina Bavaria. These specific ones I'm gonna be adding at different times throughout the boil. In most instances, most people will not put any type of hops in the boil at all. They're gonna add them most at Whirlpool, which is basically like when you're cooling down your wort, you're gonna stop that cooling process at about 175 degrees. You let it sit for a hop stand for about 15 minutes, and then you continue cooling down. The rest of the hops will go in at high Krausen during your fermentation process. And that's gonna help with the biotransformation of those oils and the specific yeast, which we'll talk about next, do its job in turning those into those fruitier, citrusy flavors. In my specific case, I like to add a few uh, ounces of hops in the boil itself. In this case, my hazies are gonna be somewhere between 20 and 30 IBUs, depending on how much I add during the boil itself. I don't like to go any higher than 30, but I'm also not gonna shy away from hops because I like a little bit of bitterness, even in a hazy IPA. If that's not your thing, go ahead and leave those boil additions out. As always, I'm gonna have the entire recipe and all of this in the video description below. You can always leave comments below the video if you have any questions. Next, let's talk yeasts. And there's a lot of different ones on the market from Omega to White Labs to Y yeast, and even some dry yeast options. Let's talk about my three favorites that I've tried. Y Yeast London Ale 3 is one of the more popular ones for everyone and a go-to for a lot of different hazy IPAs. There's also a dry yeast uh, from Lollamond called Ferdant IPA, and that one's a relatively new yeast and probably one of the only hazy dry yeast uh, options that I know about. And then there's my all-time favorite, which is White Labs London Fog. That's WLP 066. And that's the one I'm gonna be using in this recipe today. I specifically made a starter for this one because we're gonna be closer to that 1067, 1069 area for original gravity. And I wanted to make sure that this had enough cells to do the job and get it done. So without further ado, let's get our grains milled up. Let's get our water additions ready and let's start mashing in. I added my water additions to the pot and stirred it up really good just before I pour this into my mash done. Then I'm gonna add my rice hulls and make sure those get mixed up very, very well. Then we're gonna pour in all of the different grains. We're gonna get those stirred up, making sure there's no dough balls. With all of those different flaked oats and white wheat, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you stir this really, really good and make sure you're using rice hulls. This is gonna help prevent getting a stuck sparge. All right, as we're getting closer to a boil here, we're gonna add our firm cap S. Just a few drops here will help prevent boil overs. All right, as we're getting up to a boil, we'll start our 60 minute timer here. But remember, we are not going to be adding any hops during the boil until the very, very end. All right, so we have our dry hops. They're all in this one here. We're gonna go ahead and put them in this paint strainer bag. And then we're gonna put one of these sous vide magnets inside of it. And we're gonna roll, uh, tie it up. Then we're gonna basically keep that magnet up towards the top of this uh, sack. We're gonna go ahead and roll it as tight as we possibly can. And then we're gonna leave that magnet like this. So then when we, we uh, put the other magnet on the outside of our fermenter, we can go ahead and clamp this on here. 
and it will stay uh, perfectly uh, pulled up to the top until we are ready to pull off our magnet and drop it down into our beer. All right, with about 15 minutes left in the boil, I am gonna be adding a little bit of yeast nutrient to our beer. So we're gonna go ahead and put that in there. That's about a teaspoon or so. All right, we are approaching the last five minutes of the boil, so we're gonna go ahead and add our hops. I've got them already added into my hop spider here. I'm just gonna go ahead and put that in. And give it a, lot, a good stir around, make sure all those hop oils are getting out of there. For the Whirlpool, I'm gonna go ahead and start cooling this down. At about 180 degrees, I'm gonna go ahead and stop it. And then I'm gonna add all of my hops. And we're gonna go ahead and put all of those in there. And then we're gonna let it sit for about 15 minutes between 170 and 180 degrees. And then once that's done, we're gonna go ahead and cool it down as normal uh, to our pitching temperature. All right, that's gonna finish the brew day portion of it. We're gonna go ahead and pitch our yeast when our uh, wort hits 67 degrees in the fermenter. Once it hits uh, high Krausen, which is about 24 hours or so, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pull the, that magnet off, let those hops drop into the, the wort, or even just, again, slide them down the side, make sure those hops get into the wort. And so then after that, we're gonna let that thing finish out fermentation until uh, a week from now. And then I'm gonna let it condition for another week in the same primary fermenter. After that, I'm gonna cold crash that thing down uh, to the upper 30s or so. And then we're going to uh, keg it and then we're gonna try it out right at the end. So join me in just a second and we'll see how it turned out. All right, everybody, today is the day we're going to tap our Hazy IPA, which I'm calling Hop Nectar, and giving you guys my honest review for the first time tasting it ever. A couple things to note about fermentation. So this yeast I was using, which is WLP 066, which is London Fog from White Labs, that yeast took off like a champ. After 12 hours of pitching it, I already had about an inch or so of Krausen, and about 24 hours, I was able to pull the magnets off of the hot bag, let those things get into the wort, and it, then it really took off. And the Krausen was so heavy at one point, it was blowing through my uh, airlock, and I needed to put a blow-off tube, and that was still pushing yeast through that blow-off tube, even with about a gallon and a half of headspace on my Fermonster fermenter. After fermentation was completely finished up, I started the cold crash uh, process, slowly ramping that down to about the mid to upper 30s. Then I was able to close transfer to a keg and now had has been sitting on gas for a couple of days at 30 PSI and it's good and carved up. So I went ahead and I tapped it. I pitched the first pint. I have not tasted it or smelled it at all. I'm gonna give you guys my reaction to that right now. Wow, I don't even need to tell you guys about the color and the haziness because you can see it from here. It is a beautiful yellow golden color with a nice thick foam head on it and hazy as hazy could be. This is exactly what you're looking for when you get a hazy IPA. Let's go in for the aroma. When you go through the aroma, you smell those fruit uh, flavors like you're looking for. It has a really good uh, fruity smell. You get a lot of those hop characters in there. I'm really excited to try this. To be honest with you, I think it's gonna be fantastic. So let's just dive right into it. Wow. That might be one of the best hazy IPAs I've ever made. And I've brewed quite a few of them. That's really good. Um, I can tell it needs like a couple of extra days even to clean up because at the very, very back end, it has a little bit of that hop burn, which is very common for hazy IPAs when they're still very young. Uh, most people think, you know, the faster you can get them on tap, the better, but they do need a couple of days to settle out some of that hop matter, especially if you get some of that transferred into your keg for whatever reason. There's not much of that, but that will go away even with uh, a couple extra days on tap. But wow, that's what you get all, all day long is the fruit flavors and a little bit of bitterness at the beginning, which is what we were going for. But man, uh, all fruit. I'm getting the mangoes and the pineapples and the guava uh, all up front, stone fruit even flavors. Um, 
really good. I mean, there's a good mix of fruit flavors in there. And it's still got that little bit of bitterness bite that I like in a hazy IPA. I don't want them to be overly juice bombed. And this is perfect right up the alley of what I would be going for when looking for a hazy IPA at any brewery. I don't really have anything bad to say about it other than it will clean up a little bit more with that uh, hot burn. But that is so slight in the back end that most people wouldn't even notice it. And they'd be coming back for glass after glass of this already. It is fantastic. Wow. That's an easy drinking beer. It's hazy, it's got the good mouthfeel, good head retention so far, um, and lacing, but even that will get better. This is definitely one to brew at your house. If you haven't done a hazy IPA, follow these directions to a T and you will brew a perfect hazy IPA. With that guys, hit that like and subscribe button. If you find this helpful, you can always buy me a beer. Link is in the video description below. With that, happy brewing and cheers. Hey, thanks for watching my video. I really do appreciate it. A way you can support the channel is just by buying me a beer. There's a button right there on the screen and there's a link in the video description below. You can also check out the Merchandise Center store and you can hit the video on the screen right now. You know you want to.